turn now to introducing the marvellous Andrew Whitley. I have the great privilege in counting Andrew as a very dear friend, as well as a colleague. Uh, I mean, you know Andrew Whitley, but I could say that he's been plugging away for decades to make people listen about real bread, keeping up the inspiration, teaching people, having conversations in pubs and over breakfasts and in meetings about real bread, writing Bread Matters, getting it out there, sharing his very hard-earned wisdom with, and with anybody who asked, and sometimes with people who, who didn't ask. Uh, but that's part of the fabulousness, because bread draws people in, and they start seeing the world in a different way. So many people have been inspired by his work and generosity over the years, and some have chosen to transform their lives, having had that kind of conversation, um, some of them in this room, and one of them being me. So, uh, Andrew came to our charity, Sustain, that hosts the Real Bread campaign, and said, look, this needs to be national. We need to get together. We need to be more than the sum of our parts. And we've been running that, and he's been championing it ever since, for which we thank you immensely. And he's going to talk to us now about his vision for the future of Real Bread. Thank you very much, Andrew. <laughs> Terrific pleasure to be here among this wonderful collection of breadheads, which I think you probably qualify all automatically as being, for our first major gathering since Oxford six years ago. And we really mustn't leave it that long again. Six years, far too long between this kind of uh, event. I'd really like to start, since it's, you know, we're in thanking mode, uh, by thanking Sustain for nurturing the campaign from its early days. And we're all indebted particularly to Chris, our coordinator, for making it happen in all sorts of ways, not least in providing a seemingly endless stream of bread-related puns <laughs> to keep us smiling. Seven years on, they still keep coming, which could be described as spontaneous fermentation of a very particular kind. But anyway, we all, we all owe Chris Sustain and Kath, and before her, Jeanette Longfield, uh, the, the previous coordinator, so much, because they've plugged away not given up during many fruitless funding applications and rebuffs from people who might have been expected to get the argument for better bread and its importance in dealing with diet-related ill health and making society a better place. But they've also kept their nerve when harassed by big millers and bakers. Uh, there was a moment, which you may not have heard of, well, some of you a few years ago, when, oblivious to the enormous irony, the industrial baking lobby, which is so reluctant to come clean about what it puts into its products, took a Freedom of Information Act, if you, action, if you like, um, if you please, against the campaign. And of course, since we have nothing to hide, they could, of course, found out everything they needed to know by picking up the phone to sustain. Um, and when I said to Jeanette that I hope this attack wasn't too unnerving, because it can be, it's the intimidating forms to fill in and questions to our answer. She replied with a, a typical smile, nothing of the sort, I love it. It shows we're on the right track. And you know you're in good company when your supporters are prepared to stand up for the truth and to name bullying when it rears its ugly head. So thank you, Sustain. Now, this gathering is the real bread uprising. And an uprising is usually thought of as a political act, a movement of ordinary people who share a conviction that those in power are not doing things right and should be replaced or at least persuaded to mend their ways. So the word is appropriate because bread is nothing if not political. And our campaign and its supporters certainly believe that the industrial bread system is neither healthy nor sustainable and needs replacing. And I think we, aim, we here all aim to fix it one way or another and we stand therefore in a long tradition of popular movements for change animated by bread, who controls it, whether there's enough to go round, and whether it's got what it takes to keep body and soul together. Chris asked me to respond to his headline question for this gathering. Real bread is on the rise, but what does the future hold? I'm not going to dwell on the disappointing tally of only one half pun in that, <laughs> or, nor on the negative in but what does the future hold, I'm really not any more of a clairvoyant than the Chorleywood bread process is fit for purpose, but in the next few minutes I'll try and take stock of what we've achieved so far, what we might do more of or differently, and a few of the obstacles that lie in our path. I'll mention a very few of the exciting 
real bread initiatives that are on the horizon or actually happening. And I'll venture one or two thoughts about the direction we might be taking as a campaign in the next few years. And I hope that my remarks will, wait for it, work as a starter for a vigorous fermentation of ideas, plans, hopes, and intentions. So first of all, what have we achieved? Well, as Kath, Kath said, uh, put simply thousands of members and supporters in over 20 countries in our first seven years. If we were Jesuits, we would probably say that we've now got them for life, uh, the seven-year thing. Um, in fact, of course, I reckon we probably have, not in the sense of adherence to some religious dogma or membership of a hierarchical system, uh, nor, sadly, in terms of reliably renewed subscriptions. I hope one or two of you feel guilty at that. But in the sense that once you've had a chance to taste real bread and appreciate how its capacity to enliven, in the words of Robert Stapledon, can improve your life and the vitality and integrity of your communities and our wider world, you don't easily forget it, put it aside, uh, even if you can't always make, share, or get the kind of bread that carries this wonderful potential. Many of the people who've helped us get this far are in this room, and it would take too long to name and thank them all, but of the many initiatives, Breadmaker Weeks, Sado Septembers, fundraising events, and so on, that have spread the word and inspired people to start baking real bread at home or in micro or artisan or community bakeries, one or two things stand out. The School of Artisan Food, with its Welbeck Bakery and its unique, at least in the UK, one-year diploma in artisan baking, is a beacon of real bread production and training, as well as an unstinting supporter of the real bread campaign, and it, of course, didn't really exist when we last met. In very different circumstances, people all over the country are coming together around a table of real bread in projects such as Bridging the Gap and its high-rise bakers in the Gorbals in Glasgow, celebrating diverse food traditions and building social cohesion with locals and refugees alike. In their words, which have a particular poignancy at this time, we quickly discovered that bread was a great way of connecting with people, people who couldn't find a way in. Community-supported baking is almost synonymous with real bread, and it's spreading like butter on warm toast at the moment. The campaigns work on the therapeutic benefits of making bread with people with mental health issues or learning disabilities is a reflection of the growing contribution of real bread beyond the purely commercial sphere, not just filling bellies, but soothing minds and raising a laugh into the bargain. The background of the to the growing reach of real bread is, of course, the continued historical decline of the Chorleywood loaf. Tough market conditions is how the plant bakers account for sales drops of 5% or more this year alone. They seem oddly reluctant to attribute plummeting demand to any imperfections in their basic product. Giving the public what it wants, that standard justification for mediocre quality, seems to be running out of road as a defense of additive-laced loaves. And it's actually real bread bakers who are much in demand, and it's they who are setting new standards of quality in the dawning post Chorleywood era. The World Bread Awards were dominated in their first two years by campaign members, even in, in the categories that allowed and probably even expected additive-laced entries. So what we're witnessing, I think, is the gradual decommoditization of bread, the reversing of a process which has been going on for 250 years, where bread had to be kept cheap in order to absolve the, the new factory employers of paying more than just above starvation wages. Grain was sourced from low-cost producers in Russia, India, Argentina, and then in the USA and Canada, undercutting domestic farmers and forcing them to grow for yield rather than baking quality uh, and, and therefore for supply to their local milling and baking constituency, if you like, in the, in the areas where they operated. Roller mills could rapidly refine the imported hard wheats, making white flour with depleted mineral content the cheapest ingredient for bakers to use, and so condemning poorer people to a diet in which the only affordable bread 
was also the least nutritious and often the most adulterated. No change there then. All in all, I think it's fair to say that the campaign isn't doing too badly living up to its own vision, that if we make bread properly, it'll be better for you, your community, and the environment. However, much remains to be done, and there are several obstacles in our way. Despite Chris's best endeavors, we haven't gained the political traction that we hoped for and need. We've argued for honest labeling of all the additives and processing aids that go into bread, and we've submitted cogent reasons for a new approach to the mandatory fortification of white flour. We've had a couple of small successes with the Advertising Standards Authority in challenging inaccurate and misleading statements by supermarkets. But inexplicably, the ASA didn't agree with Chris's impeccably argued dismantling of Hovis's preposterous claim that the loaves that they sell today are as good as they always have been. And, it's, and it still irks me when I see that lie trundling its way up and down the motorway on the sides of Hovis' vehicles. Um, more worrying, I think, actually, is the appearance of pseudo, uh, or what Chris now has called sour foe. <laughs> it, the battle of the puns continues, you can see. Um, loaves claiming to be sourdough that are in fact no more than ordinary additive-laden dough with a bit of dried sourdough powder inactivated, so not capable of biological effect added into it. Now, imitation may be the sincerest form of flattery, uh, but the threat posed by this cynical opportunism is that it may undermine trust in real sourdough. And thousands of people, as we all know, as eaters of bread, as users of, of, of uh, as bakers of bread, and as sharers of bread, thousands of people in the last 20 years have discovered that they can enjoy long fermented bread without the bloating and digestive discomfort that they associate with industrial loaves. And if they now pick up a cheaper offering, probably in a loaf tanning salon or somewhere like that, claiming to be, <laughs> claiming to be sourdough, in which no prolonged fermentation of lactic acid bacteria has occurred, they may conclude, wrongly of course, that sourdough isn't the answer for them after all. And it's we that will suffer from that, not the people who are taking the mickey by selling this nonsense. So what we need and are campaigning for is an honest crust act, which would define key processes like sourdough and regulate labeling to prevent misinformation and worse. But to have any hope of getting such regulation, we need even more research into the beneficial effects of long fermentation, specifically with sourdough. And we need to be sure that any claims we make for our breads that are made with uh, sourdough and real bread principles in general are supported by really good evidence. And we mustn't allow ourselves to follow public misunderstanding of what we do to the point of eating inappropriately, for instance, um, grains, non-conventional so-called grains, thinking that they may have no gluten in them when they do. Um, this is a vexed issue, really, because many people have found out there on the ground that they can eat, for instance, spelt with none of the ill effects of eating ordinary wheat loaves as they would find them in the supermarket. And the, the explanation of this may well be that spelt is in some way different from wheat, even though when you look at its DNA, it's pretty similar and missing maybe some of those toxic elements that, that cause these digestive reactions in people. But it could also be simply because spelt is never used to make the Chorley Wood bread loaf. And so by eating spelt, you're simply avoiding whatever it is that's wrong with those loaves. And we need to tease out this in a systematic and, and rational way, rather than spraying a kind of general assumption that it's better to eat this or that. Uh, however well-meaning we, we, we are when we do that. And I think we also fall foul to some extent, uh, or risk falling foul, of the current regulations. Because the new food information for consumers rules require bakers for the first time to include in their in ingredient declarations the syn syn synthetic fortificants, which are calcium, iron, and two B vitamins, 
that have been added by law to all non-wholemeal UK flours since 1953. This has been a well-protected secret. And of course, it's an acknowledgement in its own right, way back when, that white flour, as it came off the roller mills, was not really fit to eat without some additional fortification. So if you use commercial white flour, organic or non-organic, you are, whether you like it or not, including additives, these four mandatory additives, in your bread. Where does that leave our definition of real bread as made without additives? I'd suggest that our response to this should be to challenge the whole basis of fortification. And I think we need farmers to grow wheat varieties and millers to adapt their methods so that the natural mineral and vitamin content, even of light flowers, would exceed the current minimum requirements and, in, cru crucially, improve over time. Because it's fairly obvious that if we're faced, on the one hand, with a crisis of overconsumption of nutritionally hollowed out food, people will be eating more slices of bread than they need to to get their basic mineral requirements, and that will contribute to diet-related problems in, in their waistlines. And those of you who have had a chance to see our little stand up the top there will see a horrifying statistic that the average waistline of a Scotsman has increased by two inches in the last ten years. Now, look ahead to our next meeting, even if it's less than six years ago, and it's horrifying to think the amount of um, belt loosening or replacement of trousers that's likely to take place if we don't do something about that particular <coughs> thing. So... Moves are afoot, and this is one of the exciting things that's happening out there in the, in the wider real bread fraternity, um, to decline, to arrest the decline of nutrient density that's seen in modern varieties of wheat, as in many other foods, actually. And our own Scotland, the Bread Project, is seeking out local heritage and relevant foreign wheats that are mineral-rich and adapted to growing conditions in northern climates. And we want to make them the basis of a revitalized Scottish bread supply that's healthy, equitable, locally controlled, and sustainable. And we hope to work clo closely with grain research projects such as uh, the Brockwell Bake Association here in England, in London, and the Welsh Grain Forum. And as with bread, so with the grain that makes it, we're trying to shift some deeply embedded practices and some powerful vested interests it is, for example, an extraordinary and surprising fact that information about the nutritional character and digestibility of the grains that are grown over millions of acres in this country, that information is only available on official lists in respect to varieties intended for feeding animals, not for the ones intended for feeding people. The information is simply not there, and this really has to change. Now, during the course of today, we'll all be thinking about how Real Bread campaign should develop and should it, for instance, major on media and policy initiatives? Or should it be organizing out there on the ground workshops, perhaps, or helping more therapeutic baking initiatives get off the ground? Resources are always limited, and so any proposals need to consider how they might be funded, of course. But, but in the, the background to this is the campaign has always tried to balance its critique of industrial commodity loaves with practical initiatives to make better bread available to everyone as of right. And I don't want to preempt any particular ideas that may emerge during the day, but I've got a few general suggestions for things that we can all do to encourage others <coughs> to join our uprising. <coughs> First of all, we can pass on the stories about what real bread can do for you, your community, and for the living world if it's produced properly from the ground up. True stories, not Hovis-type nostalgia. I had the word bollocks there, but I've changed it to nostalgia. <laughs> we can explain how real bread making is meaningful work, bringing the satisfaction of doing a job from start to finish, where each day's dough is a new attempt at perfection, or at least at a personal best, and certainly to be preferred to machine extruded uniformity. And because work like this brings benefits beyond price, we can challenge simplistic notions of productivity, which is a rather narrow measure of financial effectiveness, by calling for more jobs per loaf. So we're not, in conclusion, campaigning for some wishy-washy ideal, an imagined perfect future of better bread for all. 
You here, we here, are all the embodiment of positive change. You who get up very early and stay up very late to bake as you do, finding places and opportunities to share bread and so turn strangers into companions, learning about the science of nutrition and applying it to, honestly, without shortcuts or secret adulteration, and showing others how to make good bread. In some, making the change real, convinced as we are that changed loaves lead to changed lives. Long live the real bread uprising. Thank you.